So tonight we're going to go into how to uh, estimate renovations, yeah. analyze costs, minimize mistakes. Um, just so you all know, we have a great seminar once a month, usually. Every now and then we have an off month where, you know, maybe it's the middle of summer, nobody's available, so we skip a month. But for the most part, we probably do this almost every month. Uh, and we rotate the the topic. There's a few I like to do multiple times a year, which is number one, the Burr method. Um, that's something I use to invest. And I think it's the most uh, effective way of scaling a portfolio quickly. But so I do that a couple of times a year. Burr, it's just an acronym, stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance. And that's how I buy rental properties. Um, and that's not something that's new. It's something that's been going on forever. Just before online forums like Bigger Pockets and YouTube and you know podcasts, no one talked about it. You know, it was kind of like a secret niche that investors would sell at these seminars if you were able to find one. Um, but now everyone's talking about it, and you know, it's a really really good way to scale a portfolio. So we'll touch a little bit on some of that during this, but. There's usually two of these each year that really focuses on the burr. I use some pretty specific examples of properties that I've used and done that process with and to show how it can work, how it could be really good, how it could be really bad, depending on you know how you do it. All right. It's buy, renovate, rent, refinance. Mm -hmm. And some people add an extra R in there and say repeat, but you know. It's just, it's a, it's a way of rinsing your money, right? So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, in 2018, I bought a row home in Southwest Philadelphia with my sister. Got it for super cheap. It was like $35,000. We needed about $30,000 in work. And I had about $5,000 in like holding costs, things like that. So I was about $70,000 all in. So I bought it, renovated it. Found a tenant for it. At the time, I was getting like $1,100 a month. And then I went to a local credit union. I went to Pennsylvania or Philadelphia Federal Credit Union, asked them to come out and appraise the property, which I knew it was going to appraise for $100. Um, it appraised for $100. I asked them to give me a 75% loan on that, which was seventy-five grand. So I got all of my money back. I have a loan on it, but I have a tenant that's paying that loan, right? And I was able to start over again. So... You can do that in small scales like that. You can do that. I've done that with an 11, a 10 unit building in Pottstown where we bought it for 540, uh, financed the 75% of the purchase price, got a second lender for the 25% down payment and my holding costs uh, and renovation costs. Um, Renovated it over a year and a half. So it slowly turned all the tenants over, raised the rents. Uh, and then when we were done, refinanced it, appraised for nine forty, and we were six seventy into it or something. And was able to get all the money back, pay back the first lender, pay back the second, actually made a little bit of money and still cash flow. Right. It's a fun process if it works. Right. So you kind of have to start in the back and the end and work your way back. Make sure you know what your AR, your ARV after repair value is, which can be tricky when you get to multifamily um, because you're not looking at comps anymore. You're looking at cap rates, price per unit based on the market you're in, which gets a little bit more involved. Um, you're looking at that, you're figuring out, hey, after it's fully renovated and rented out, do my rent support the mortgage I'm going to get when I'm done? Like, am I doing all this to make no money, which is pointless, right? Um, you know, there are people that invest for equity and they say, well, I don't care if it doesn't make a whole lot of money, but we're all investing for money, right? So it needs to make some money, you know? Um, and for me, that number is usually, I, I know it sounds small, but to be honest with you, it's realistic. I look for $100 per month per door after everything is paid. It's what I want to make. So if I have, if it's two of us, I want to make $200. You know, if it's four of us, $400, pure profit. So after um, all my fixed expenses, like taxes, insurance, 
lawn care, snow, and utilities I'm paying, sewer line coverage, like literally everything you can think of in, you know, internet for your, your security system, um, your rental licenses, all of those things are paid and your variable expenses are paid. So I put away 10% for a property manager, 5% for expenses, 5% for vacancies, and my mortgage is paid. I That's what I want to walk away with. Now, people are like, well, that's not a whole lot. Yeah, that's that's how real estate investing works. It's not a get rich quick scheme. It's, you know, you do have to build up a portfolio before you're really, now you can get lucky and there are, like Airbnbs that do really well off the bat, which is different. But if you're looking for the stacking units method, that's that's a realistic, you know, number to look at. Any questions about that before I keep going? Yeah, well, yeah. everything else might be a little bit more advanced. Sure. This is our first, like all good. That's what this is for. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, that's what this is for. We have, I've had people come with no experience. I've had people come with hundreds of units. It's, you know, yeah. Yeah, so feel free to ask as many questions as you want. We got the room until at least eight o'clock, so. All right, so uh, just to go over what GRID is. GRID is a global real estate community built for investors by investors. There are, thousands of grid communities. Uh, I run Grid Delco, but there's Grid Springfield, Grid Philadelphia, Grid, you know, Montgomery, like Alabama. There's grids all over the place. There's grids in all countries. Once you start coming to these, you can go on their Facebook pages. You can join all of their uh, their chats and there's investors in there sharing deals. There's lenders talking about lending. It's here for investors to talk to each other. So use the community. It's free. It's just for uh, in like-minded investors to kind of talk and network, find deals, help each other, things like that. Um, we're not gurus. Uh, we're just a group of people doing real estate deals, right? So not here to sell you anything. This isn't, this is free, right? Uh, so our mission to connect, learn from, and collaborate with like-minded people interested in building wealth and creating impact through real estate. The goal is to achieve income flipped by building and buying assets that generate enough passive income to cover our expenses, right? That's the dream for most real estate investors. It's how do I get to the point that my rental portfolio is covering my expenses, right? You can become a flipper and be a flipper as an investor. But I always like to remind people, being a flipper is just another job, right? It is not passive. It's a job. And if you don't have deals, you don't make money, right? And great ex recent example was COVID happened. And I knew flippers around here that were flipping, you know, a lot of homes every year. And then they couldn't find deals because, everyone was buying homes, right? Right. And right. And pre-COVID, rarely would I be in a situation as an investor where I'm bidding against a regular homeowner. Post during COVID and post-COVID, nine times out of 10, I'm bidding against regular homeowners. And that made it really hard to get deals. You know, even if you're you were someone buying deals at the sheriff's sale, people were getting very desperate to find homes just to live in rightfully so, and you were no longer finding good deals. It was harder to find deals. So if you're a flipper, that income can dry up very quickly. You know, and if you're not using that flip income to invest in more passive assets like rentals or Airbnbs or things like that, uh, you know, again, it's just another job. Yeah. Sure. Um, so do you see it getting better now than when it was during COVID? Like mm -hmm. the housing market is is kind of sort of kind of switching, mm -hmm. but the amount of houses mm -hmm. are I think the inventory because most of the inventory was during COVID. Sure. And then everybody bought up houses. Yeah. So are you seeing any any change in that? No. Yeah. So 
I'll uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um like real estate agent or something like property management license and some insurance as well. And it's in Philly, the realtors that I know and work with, you price them at a reduction that you're gonna after maybe two weeks of putting on the market, mm -hmm. you're gonna see a five or ten percent drop. And that kind of resets that they stay out of that room. They go, like, oh, wow, we're really going to sell this house. They're going to list at that price now. Right. That price is still out of the market. So exactly. they're still going to be paid from the high water market code. Cool. Right. And where that property value is shown. But in Philadelphia County, is still out of the desire for those that are going to be. But every county, even if you move across the border into Wilmington. We'll get out of Philly in certain pockets and different areas. And there's value there for the inventory that's being built up. Right. But I see a lot of REMAX team that I sell to put a $1.5 million property in Phoenixville mm -hmm. and it sold the trees. Bam. And it's like, well, how many buyers are we? The amount of buyers that actually could be out there are looking for $1.5 million. Oh. Like, how many higher yeah. taxes are out there? Yeah. Actually, buy these things, but it's still uh, it is price, and you look at your house, so it's priced at the market where it should be, and it says. And so yeah. it's people can still get aggressive with pricing, and that kind of shows, but the market will fix mm -hmm. the price. And yeah. and I think so. My house is in Vermont, and what I'm seeing now is low inventory, and you know, people are now, and the houses are the value is really low. As yeah. far as what I'm able to, that I wouldn't have thought, you know, just in four years. Yeah. That price went, you know, I don't, I don't know. You would have the interest rates and stuff. Yeah. Kind of but happened. they went higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either spending low or yeah. that same, but we're seeing almost like a 5% month over month increase of the summer and people want to live. Yeah. So unless you find a really good deal that's today, it's not a good deal. Yeah. You know, well, so there's on, right, it's right. right. It's again, it's all about the numbers and you don't, and I would say totally agree with him is I'm, I'm in real estate. I run a real estate team. Like houses are selling like crazy in the suburbs. There's not enough in court. That's the problem, right? There's a ton of people and you know, the population keeps going up and where else is there to build in Delaware County, Montgomery County, even the further regions of Chester County, you know, areas where I wouldn't sell houses five years ago. Now they're building one one point five million dollar houses and they're being scooped up because we're kind of tapping out the area. Right. It's something you mentioned before everyone got here where you started talking about you're looking further out like Allentown. I did that four years ago and it started to get tapped out then, too. Right. Like they're expensive out there now, too. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but that shouldn't scare you. There's people doing deals and they're finding deals. They're just getting creative, right? Yes. If your house is listed with a realtor on the multiple listing service, everyone sees it, right? And you're not fighting against regular home buyers. That's a losing battle. If you're an investor, it makes no sense to pay what a regular home buyer would pay because they don't need meat on the bone. You as an investor does, does. So generally, if a property hits the market, now this doesn't mean you won't find good deals. I have investors that I work with regularly that we find deals on the MLS. We do. They just know the market they're buying in. So like I have guys that will only buy in Sharon Hill or only buy in Upper Darby because they know how much they can pay, exactly what number to put on it, exactly what to do to get the right value out of it. And they'll make it happen. You know, and I have relationships with a lot of those agents. So we, we generally, you know, we generally are able to to make it work, right? Doesn't mean you can't find deals on the MLS. You have to be just very just be very specific. All right. Let's talk about a couple other ways to find deals since we're kind of on that path. You know? Multiple listing well, service. So, and so that's what realtors use. Mm -hmm. So there's levels. The, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's like, yeah. The, the sheriff's house that they turn the tap off in Philly, I don't think they're going to be able to see them. That's what they need to 
behind the property that somebody would go into, you have to auction the city home because of the tax burden, and then they doesn't give the city anything to sit on assets and they need cash flow. So they sell the shares. I mean, we've got one more free block. Uh, and then people can pay all our properties. And it's stranger once in a while when it doesn't get bid on. And then somebody will see their opportunity. And I don't get it for like seven, eight, ten, ten, ten. They work out of one of them like waiting for a whole day and buying their house. And I get to say, I'm ready to oh, very few. But like most of the time, it's people would realize you know, we're, you'll get a listing and you'll get the paperwork and the public people will come in and they're rolling out the whole drive by their properties. Because they want to house part of the national. It's a little like the, the city is well. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. And, and run of that home, but we've already looked at our cost estimator. It's not in the right neighborhood. They basically have most of the um, corporations that they sell. Like, it's not good. I mean, I wish the corporation didn't exist. I wish there was an account on the type of properties in Blackstone or something that owns to make sure that all of us actually live in the East of Iowa. Yeah. But they start these companies that we built to then create a web service that closes their leads. And then they have agents that they pay like 25 grand a year to they run around and have places to try to keep it stopping out. Yeah. Okay. They didn't know all the offers. Yeah. But when that doesn't work, they still have to be there. And they have to be up to a year later a week and next week and they have more things on it. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So the opportunities are out there. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fun. If everyone buys it, should be slightly different, but looking for the hidden gem instead. If you yeah. stay in lane and pick something you really want to do, like for a while, I was there to do these. Yeah. They weren't really well, especially in the city of Philadelphia. But then they changed their policy. And yeah. I only applied for what's called an LLL. And I don't get five thousand dollars a year to come to Bob. You keep what you were getting me out. Yeah. Just okay. a two week bail scenario, one time somebody brought the county and it's right one of their tenants. It's just, it wasn't worth the extra money. And we'll get a little bit of a headache. 
What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know a few guys that do Airbnb down there to like the flight attendants. You know. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. No, no. No, that was good info for sure. No, keep, keep keep asking, believe me. We'll get through everything even with questions. All right, so uh, it, it's really important, especially for yourselves, like starting off investors, understanding you are building a business, right? If you're going to run an investment business, like I invest, it's my side hustle, you know, but it's a business. I have a system to that business. You know, it means 11 p.m. at night, which is the only time I have because that's when my kids are asleep and that's when the phone stops ringing is when I can look at properties, right? And where I'm looking for properties it, and the types of properties I'm looking for, it takes some due diligence. And so, you know, I've added a layer of one of my partners who is one of my business partners. I have him evaluate it to see if it gets to my level before I spend the time at 11 p.m. at night to look at it, right? And, and I have... You know, like I said, I'm I'm an agent, but I work with agents all over the state of Pennsylvania to find me deals. So if they find me a deal that makes sense, you know, so I have people out there working for me and I'll use them as my agent happily because they got me a good deal. Um, and so you have to find, have a system. Similarly, you mentioned the good way to find deals. He kind of touched on this, but there's things like wholesalers, right? There's little wholesalers that ho are you familiar with wholesaling or what that is? So wholesaling, if you ever see those signs like we'll buy houses cash or you get those flyers, most of them aren't actually going to buy your house cash, right? They're sending you a letter to get you to bite, to say, hey, come over, take a look at my house. You go over, you take a look at the house and they say, okay, we know it's worth this. We know we can sell it to someone for this. We're going to pay you this. We're going to tell you this is what your house is worth. And we're going to sign a contract with you. And then we're going to market that contract to our people, our investors. We're actually going to hand the contract over to them before we close. They're actually the one buying the house. We are, right? And they're taking an assignment fee in the middle. Wholesalers find you better deals because they're off-market deals. Seller doesn't actually know what their house is worth. If they do, they probably would have listed it on the market. Or they're serving a purpose, right? Like maybe the wholesale, the seller just didn't want to deal with all the crap. Like they didn't want to clean the house out. They didn't want to deal with inspections. They didn't want to deal with a bunch of showings. They thought the house was too dangerous and it was a risk to show. There are legitimate reasons that the seller could just want to sell it off market, right? And so if you Google wholesalers or you go on Instagram or Facebook and you look at, you can find a ton of groups locally. I'm on most of them. And I'm always, I, I highlight when they post, I get not notified when they're posts because I want to see what they're posting. Because those deals are generally going to be better than what's on the MLS, right? So, yeah, it's actually down. Actually, there's one right here. Yeah, there's one right here to the left. Yeah. 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 So, you don't have to have a real estate license to be a You were living in your house, and you know, it's worth 200 today because of conditions that might be worth up to but I don't want to do 100 because I know I can sell for 150. I know that once somebody puts 10 or 20,000 work into it, then it can be evaluated at 200, which can have a fair market price of what you talk. If I'm the pilot, you know, basically we're running on the sales contract, then, then I'm going to take a shot at this. And I'm going to make a commission on the market. So I pay 100, I pay anything that I have here, all the parts of the wrong contract, and I'm going to shot at this. I would say this is a hundred. You're going to pay me what fifty million 
So I'm going to make 50,000, but I only make it two quarters. And then it's just there the checks on that, and you're getting 50,000, but it has nothing to do with you buying and selling real estate and doing a paper transaction where I realize that it's not just a dollar back. That's all I'm going to pay for that version of it, but I'm negotiating that way. So you don't actually have to have a real estate license to do that. There's a lot of other companies just have flyers. So being a builder, like he was saying, you get a lot of, you work with a lot of, and they can bring you. So you've got to be a builder. So I do have a, a kind of a maybe a taboo take on this, but I'm a real estate agent. I run a real estate team. I don't, I asked my real estate agents not to wholesale. Uh, I don't personally wholesale because the real estate right says it's my fiduciary right to get the most value for my clients, right? Me wholesaling isn't me doing that. Now, if I have a client, correct. So I don't mind buying houses from wholesalers because again, I wasn't involved in the upfront negotiation. And if a client comes to me and I have had it happen where they're like, we absolutely don't want this to go on the market. I will have them write it on the agreement that you understand, hey, I could probably get you this. I showed you the comps, but you're willing to settle for this. Let's both initial this because I don't want to risk my license, right? Because that's my real job, right? So I don't want to risk that. So I don't think realtors should be doing it. But again, that's not, I don't make the rules. I just kind of, you know, do what I do. But wholesalers serve a purpose and you can find really good deals from them. And making them a part of your business is important as an investor, right? If you have some really good wholesalers or maybe just one that's just getting started and they're actually finding good deals and they actually know what they're doing, they're running title on these deals and they're not wasting everyone's time, you could have a gold mine right there. You could have a guy or girl that's hustling, making the calls, finding new deals, running title, making sure they make sense and presenting you with good deals. And if you're doing them right, by not beating them up on their price by, you know, maybe, you know, then you have a lead flow. So that's, and that's, that's kind of like finding someone to be your levels one, two, one and two. That's finding someone to be the sales and marketing. Cause that's what the wholesaler is doing. They're doing marketing and they're doing sales, right? If you don't want to do that stuff, find people to do it for you, right? Find wholesalers, find realtors, find people that will go to share. So like find people to do that level of stuff for you because you're a business owner. And that's part of being a business owner is delegating, right? So uh, understanding that is important. You're not just going to get a realtor and say, hey, send me what's on the MLS. And, you know, it's going to take you years to find a good deal in this market, in our area. And to kind of speak to your first question about what my thoughts are on the market is everyone, you know, kind of looks at the real estate market as this whole thing when it's not, it's regional, right? Our region is different than two hours from here. Our region is different than Florida or Texas. There are markets that are already hurting. Like I know agents in Florida and in Texas that there, there have houses sitting on the market for 70, 80 days, right? Even Philadelphia. There's pockets of Philadelphia, the average days on market is 70 days right now, whereas there are pockets that the average days are three. So it's Philadelphia's a neighborhood, but it's very regional. And in our area, there's not enough inventory for it to slow down. So, um, all right. So <laughs> to get to this real quick, uh, who am I? Yes, to qualify to be a grid leader, you do have to have some qualifications. Uh, I'm... Will Holder, I run the William Holder Realty team and a part owner of Rudy Max Classic in Wayne. Uh, I run this group because I'm a real estate investor. I'm looking for deals, partnerships. Uh, you know, every property I own, I have a partnership with. I don't own anything by myself. Even my house, my wife owns that with me, you know. So I don't own anything by myself, you know. Nothing's mine. Uh, and that's okay, you know, as far as she knows, right? <laughs> no. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're we're... I, I, you know, I don't partner with a lot of people, but I partner with people that I've met that I've forged relationships with. And that's how I've been able to scale my portfolio. Um, I have, uh, okay. Um, what do I want to accomplish with you guys? Obviously it's help you grow, help you learn, help you understand investing in real estate to me, strong, really good investors help a market in general, right? You have a lot, bunch of crappy landlords, just bringing down rents, dragging down property values. It's not good for anyone. 
It's not good for homeowners in the area. It's not good for other landlords. It's not good for the township. Nobody wants that. So I do think there's a right way to do things. And then there's a way that a lot of people do it, which doesn't help anybody. And I think we could do that together. And you can connect with me through uh, Meetup, Instagram, Facebook. You know, I'll give you my information at the end. Feel free. Um, about myself, I'm currently a real estate investor. I have about 70 units throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, I do flips. I do about two or three flips a year. Again, I don't love them. They're kind of a necessary evil, I call them. You know, they're just to fund buying rentals for me. Um, and I'm in interested in burrs. I love burrs. It's pretty much what I've done. I don't think I've ever bought anything turnkey. Um, even my house, I fixed that up. Like, I just don't have any interest in ever buying anything turnkey. I don't know why. Anyone that has any ability to do a renovation project would would ever buy anything turnkey. There's you know there's so much money to be made and value to be earned um, with a little bit of work. Uh, I'm no longer. I used to buy row homes, duplexes, you know, single families. In the right market, I will. But for the most part, I'm mostly interested in multifamily now. Um, we are pretty much targeting Western Pennsylvania. I've kind of worked my way out there at this point and. That's the majority of what I'm looking to buy and have bought in the last year um, because of the prices. I mean, I bought like a 10 unit for 375 in Pittsburgh, you know, so it's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to get that here, you know, so. No, so, right, yeah, if it's within a half, with, just a lot of phone calls, yeah. Usually I start with property managers. So when I moved out there, so that wasn't like my, when I first was buying here, Philadelphia, Delaware County, then I moved out to Montgomery County. Then I pushed out to Carbon County because I looked at like Allentown, Bethlehem, and it was a little too, getting a little too pricey. So I pushed even further out. So Carbon County is like Jim Thorpe, Tamaqua. It's about 20, 30 minutes west of like Allen, uh, that whole region, Lehigh Valley region. And um, I called a bunch of property managers, found one I liked. They recommended a bunch of contractors, property managers, realtors, whoever don't like to give out names of people that are going to burn them. You know, it does happen, but you know, they give you bad referral. It looks bad on that one, right? So a good place to start is to ask who their people are, you know, kind of crowdsourcing your information. Um, uh, and then same, once I pushed out Pittsburgh, it was the same process. Just find a good property manager with a ton of good reviews and then dig into what they have to offer. Um, uh, hoping to learn is if anyone ever has any deals. You know, I do do a couple of flips a year locally. I don't do any flips outside of the area because I, I manage my own flips. So I like to be within a 30 minute radius of them. Um, but if you know anyone has any deals, it's a way to make money too. You know, you could do a wholesale without being a wholesaler, you know. You have a family member that wants to sell a house. You have a buyer that could buy it. Simple, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's go around the room real quick. Start over there. And... Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say that yet. But I Awesome. Awesome. I know you guys shared a little bit already, but feel free to share more. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, my name is Sidney, and I'm not a And basically, um, this is all new to me. And then um, we're probably going to create this today. I really don't know really yet, but I'm here to gain information. I think um, if you need to use it and pen, you know, paper or just gain knowledge. Sure. Um, what are you looking to learn? What are you going to learn? 
every place of living on property, get the houses, mm -hmm. um, sheriff's sale, um, you know, um, yes, seven, which is very good. So, how do you get the benefit from the group? Um, group education and networking. Yeah, awesome. I'm well, you know, I'm going to get there. 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 I'm going to get um, I guess right now we're going to have some stuff about small, probably on the boats, and then we're going to have a lot of people that are going to be able to do that better. Uh, they can learn as much as they can, and that kind of thing. Um, whatever you need to do, it's going to be done. Uh, I think that's what we need. So, we've already got to do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and we thank it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, and I didn't mean to like a lot. No, it's good. Yeah. Okay, I'm Russell, and I'm saying yes, yes. Um, you know, the things I've used over time is full units where you're living in one. Basically, well, you say it's two years later, so that you sell a property, the portion of your rental, you can get that gains, which is nice. uh, it's very quite well over time. Uh, properties that are linked to the family, as well as, I mean, all the families, but they're very unique, you know, one generational living, so it's like in law suite or something else, where it's not traditional to do that. On a scale of higher people, you can see like, oh, we have my mom, we have my mom, my in law that's really good in our house, and she so came and bought a ton of time, and we kind of put my out, you know, chase that property, which is kind of this step up of value when people kind of see, like, oh, why is it actually pictures? Why is it space like this? And it just brings an extra level of what people can do. We're not going to price it, so yeah, sir. Um, what I hope to learn is uh, so I spent the last year and a half uh, mostly with me. Um, I did seven trips over there. My wife and I are buying a property in custody, and that's taken up a lot of time. So my wife and I in law with all our immigrants, and we went to 1987. So I'm not under the 90 day veto bill, but I have a position in the zone of the EU. Because by my citizenship and family unification act and have it with most of Europe, I don't have to stay there under her privilege citizenship for as long as we would ever want. We also get a few tax benefits for time in Italy as a Polish citizen. It's like we it's all of us are in Texas. So we're allowed to do it, we can live there, we can buy a property. Yeah. So the Polish citizens are allowed to just get out of Italy, buy something in Italy for them. Uh, there's a 90% currency tax, which kind of hits everybody over their head, but we're kind of like six to get that, it's a new set of two percent for us. And my goal with that is to make up to $120,000 per person because then you get taxed by the U.S. government. So you can make money abroad and not have any government hand with your income you're making, up to what right now is 127 k per person. So I want to have personally five and six rentals that want to be somewhere between 20 25,000 each. Then when I am 61, 41 house and 20 years from now, my wife and I can go entire Italy. Um, we have kids. So it's a different scenario for a lot of people, but to be able to go to another country and retire, I have a name because my wife is a citizenship, so I have a little cat bird seat. And after I think one of the years we did that I just realized it changed a lot in the US. Uh, where Italy is a little bit more traditional and they're also happy for tourism to be brought in. And uh, I have a property investor and I'm kind of following Italy. I'm not flying wide, but I'm kind of following the steps of somebody who's over there. And I have a wonder contract for my first one that was a Five or six months, we're planning on closing sometime in September or October. We're buying something there in the um, And I was trying to buy this whole part of business. We want to keep it for the summertime. So we're going to wait. Also, financing costs in Italy 30% down. Um, 
a 3.09 percent thirty year fixed rate with lowest pattern fee out of all the year. All the rates are set by the IMF. We're going to have the monetary fund. It's not your own power sitting in the fire power looking at, oh, what's too high? It's all going to raise it. It makes no sense. Um, but over there, they do things cheap. It shouldn't be down the end. It has to be for the internet. It's not going to be an investor. Uh, usually, they have 50% of that for the lender. But your overall principal interest on our loan, which is roughly divided to 160. We're financing about one ten, and that one ten PMI is it's like uh, all fifty dollars, like five hundred and two dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And it's just a gives the option to go over the red tape for that. We're looking at so the low end in the slow season, which is right enough to get in these needed Easter and end of October. Really, the end of September, it spills in October because of other things, travel settings and stuff. So, then from October to let's call it the beginning of March, we'll be at about $100 a night. And in the summertime, close to double that, we will average 175 It'll be a sliding scale. And you have these property managers that are really dialed to the prices, so things that heat up. You have weekends on book. We kind of just stay set and set with all the rest of the prices that are out. Product management fee over there is 20% off the top. We use 21% of the town of taxes. It's been a little bit of a quick swallow that I'm paying over 59 or 60% of what I get from the rental side. When we look at the finance cost and what I have personally, if my wife insists, she should be able to go over there, it's the right room for me to sell the Airbnb that I have to be able to finance this because I just didn't want to move to see Philadelphia. Yeah. So, um, public learn really like to stay in my reach. I was very clean centric with any investing I did before. I was living in Kensington and then we moved out to Delta. And you know, man, this stuff we had, it just it took a back seat because I got really annoyed with the city. So, that version of how like, the niche I went there, I thought that was not oversaturated, but I didn't see the, the reason to jump. Too much more than what I really was. I see like all that other stuff. Uh, so I also work for these type of shifts, and it's, it's been very helpful to have new people and be able to give you an idea of like, hey, you said the properties we should talk because that can save you fifty dollars a month for all of them. Well, mm -hmm. it's a tough change in the seven properties. Mm -hmm. so seventy doors, not, not but seventy doors, but yeah, doors. twenty properties. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I don't want seventy properties. It's a lot of edits. <laughs> it's, so it's and it's, yes, insurance. I'd love to talk because yeah. insurance is crazy these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, insurance is wild. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, my name's Casey. Uh, I actually work for the Bed. Awesome. Uh, so, do you live in still live in the city? 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Um. Awesome. Where'd you go? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing. That was great. So just a few quick things before we get into it. Don't hold anything I say against me. You know, this is just free information. You know, it's it's investor to investor. That's what this says. Don't sue me if you don't like what you heard. Um, we also, this is recorded on Zoom. So if it will be posted on like my YouTube page, if for some reason your voices are heard on there, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, don't tell anyone your social security number. Uh, so just a couple quick picks just to go over some ideas in terms of what you should do. Now, understanding the type of investing you're trying to do is the most important, right? If you're planning on doing flips, high-end flips, you probably don't want to figure out your own design. You probably want to get a designer, an architect involved. That's a whole different story. If you're looking to uh, do a moderate flip in a residential neighborhood, you know, you could probably piece it together. And I tell a lot of my investor clients, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? So if three houses that were flipped sold for this price and this is the price you want, look at their pictures and just do what they did, right? That's one of the easiest ways to do a flip. And I love doing it that way because I used to get cute and creative with the ones I did in the beginning and I would always lose money because I'm spending too much time getting creative, right? If it's working, don't fall in love with the property. Don't try to have little niches and, you know, uh, accent walls and go crazy. What you like isn't going to necessarily give you a return on your investment. So, yes, when you see flips, a property, and they all look the same and they have gray walls and the same laminate flooring and, you know, white shaker cabinets, it's for a reason. It's working and it's affordable. And that's what gives the investor a spread. So, that's why you do it that way, okay? Um, if you're buying rentals to fix them up, pick, you can pick a level of finishes, literally a scope of work. So I'm going to use these poles from Amazon. Here's the link, right? Uh, I'm going to use these types of cabinets. I'm going to use these types of floors. Here's a link, here's a link. And you can hand it to your contractor and say, this is what I want in that apartment. Right. And I already know this laminate is a dollar fifty a square foot. And this is a you know 200 square foot room. I can figure out what my floor is going to cost me because my contractor told me, hey, I'll charge you two bucks a square foot to install. Right. These are conversations you have with your contractor. Um, and we're gonna go further into this, but I will say disclaimer, it's really hard to find a good contractor. Right. And that's going to be your number one issue as an investor, in my opinion. I, especially if you're doing flips, um, there's this fine line in contractors where they're either really good and they know it. So they charge you for it. And listen, if it's your house, pay that guy. Right. Like that's the person you want doing your house. Right. Uh, or they're really good and they don't know, and you might get a good job or two out of them, but they're going to figure it out and they're going to become too expensive. And all right, good for them. Or they aren't any good and they're going to blow your budget up and you're going to have to start over and lose a bunch of money. Or they're good, but they're going to fall apart because they don't understand how to be a project manager. They understand they could be a good contractor. And when you go from doing one job with them to two, all of a sudden they're spread and it gets overwhelming and it blows up. Right. I've seen it go all the different ways personally. And no matter who, I won't recommend contractors to my regular residential clients ever. I tell them, go find someone on Google with plenty of reviews because I've been burned so many times. I don't want to ruin that relationship anymore. It's you cannot depend on a small niche contractor that has no reviews or you know, everyone in the neighborhood kind of knows them, you know, like you got to if, if it's a client or it's your house, go with somebody reputable. When you're an investor, you're looking for that little diamond that might sink eventually, but for now it works, right? So understanding that's important. Whatever your contractor tells you, add to it, right? I usually add 15% to 
to my contractor's bid. That's about the number I go with. It can be less, sure, but you know that's just what your contractor is going to do. So I recommend if you have a contractor, even though they seem great and they tell you it's a hundred thousand dollar bid, your budget is one fifteen immediately, right? Like just start there, and that's what you're going to tell your bank as well, right? This comes in with the financing part. If you're if you're doing a flip or even a BRRRR, and you use a fix and flip loan where the bank's giving you 80% of the purchase price and 100% of the renovation costs, overinflate your renovation costs, right? Because you're going to need it, right? And it, 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 I've never been in a situation where my contractor came in under budget. It just doesn't happen. They don't have, that's not, you know, I'd rather be overestimating. But again, this is factors into how much you offer for the property. So you're building that estimation into your initial offer on the property. Right. If my rental budget is 115 versus 100, I'm going to offer 15 less for that house than I would have if I based it on my contractor. Right. And hey, if your contractor comes in or under budget, you made more profit. So, you know, good business. Right. <clears throat> so, with this house, like you see, they painted the brick, they kept the siding, but they painted the shutters. These are just little things that people do to not spend like crazy you know i have a client making an offer on a house out in uh in aston and you know his buddy that's with them is like oh we got to replace the side no you don't you know you paint those shutters fix the broken pieces but you don't touch that side you're gonna get no return on that right what you want to do is make the kitchen beautiful you know and those are things those are conversations you have with yourself another quick example obviously moldy bathroom not great um one thing I do regularly for bathrooms, especially for rentals, and I do them for some flips too, versus it, it, you'll see it around here in Delaware County. They call it the Delco tile. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but they're, most of the bathrooms around here, they were done in the 50s. They have these giant thick tiles that are like pink and blue and green and white in every house in Delaware County. And if you try to rip them out, they're a thousand pounds because they're overlapped and it's insanely heavy. Um, I just reglaze them. Right. I don't rip them out because it's a ton of time. My contractor spends a ton of money getting rid of that trash. So we just have a reglazer come in. They spray glazing over the entire bathroom. It looks like a nice new white tile bathroom. It cost me twelve hundred dollars versus just the demo on that bathroom would have been more than that. Right. So, again, if it's even in a low end flip, that works. Right. And honestly, up to mid tier, it might work, too. You know, really don't need to always go rip out the bathroom. There are ways to get creative, you know. Uh, when it comes to bathrooms, if you're looking, if you're doing a residential home, you always want a tub. You know, it's like hints 101, don't get rid of the tub. You know, people, families, they want a tub, you know, to give it. A, I'm a realtor. Yeah, I show houses. The first question I get from most is that I need a tub in one of the bathrooms. You're eliminating a ton of your buyers who can get rid of your tub. And I see so many contractors do it. I don't know why, you know, it, it's necessary. Right. Like a nice dog with something standalone, $1,000. Yeah. Yep. And again, you look at this, it looks really nice. I tell you, most of those finishes aren't super expensive. You can get that vanity at Home Depot for 150 bucks, buy that light fixture for like $80. These aren't expensive finishes that they're putting in here, but it looks night and day compared to what was there before, right? Honestly, like even in a safe case like this, you could have saved that toilet. It doesn't look terrible. You know, these are things you factor when you're doing, especially if it's a rental. Um, getting cute with removing walls isn't always the easiest. I will say that. Uh, in most townships, they want an engineer's report, which adds to your budget, right? That's something you have to factor. Also adds time. Most engineers aren't going to turn around a report in a day or two. It's going to be a couple of weeks, if not two, three weeks. 
and you don't get your permits to start until you have that. So factor that up front. If you're going to remove walls or do anything structural, try to get that all out of the way as quickly as possible. The problem is I'd never recommend commissioning an engineer or an architect before you close. Deals fall apart all the time for the most insane reasons. I mean, I've had people die the day before closing. Like it's just anything could happen. And the minute you start spending money, you're losing money until you make it back. If you don't own the house and you're spending money on an engineer, so factor that into your budget, right? If you're borrowing, factor that into the interest you're going to pay on that loan while you hold it, right? So the cost of removing a wall might not benefit in terms of the return after you factor all the expenses that come along with it and the time. And yes, most houses you see now are white shaker cabinets and quartz countertops and white subway tile. It's because if you go to floor and decor or you can order them on Amazon, the tile, or you go to Home Depot, it's available, one, which you know available is huge because it doesn't hold up your profit. And two, it's way cheaper than most because it's in the it, it's available, you know. So um you will see this stuff quite often. Uh, and it's for a reason, right? So again, these are just some examples of things to do. Now, points to consider. We don't have time or desire to go look at every house that we consider, right? And this is this goes back to like being a first-time investor or a new investor. Pick an area and stick to it, right? If you want to find deals, pick an area. It could be a zip code. It could be a township and say, hey, I'm going to look for houses in this area. And that's all I'm going to look for. Because most areas were built around the same time, and most of the houses look the same. And if you know how to evaluate one, you can kind of estimate what all the rest look like. And that makes your time in figuring out if this is a good deal way less, right? So don't cast this wide net of like, I'm going to look here and here, and this deal is great, and this, no, 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 like, hone in and you will find a deal faster, right? I'm not saying it's impossible to do it that the other way. I'm just saying this is a quick way to get started, right? Just pick an area. Um, even if we did, it certainly isn't a good idea to use up your time or your contractor's time to write up a full estimate on a house you may not buy, all right? This is huge because if your contractor has enough time to be with you at every house you go to and write up a bid, I'd be worried about working with that contractor. What else are they doing? They're not doing any jobs, right? So that's not a good contractor, right? So I like it when my contractor's too busy to be with me. It's fine. Sometimes if I'm really unsure, I'll go do videos and I'll ask the questions in the video and I'll send it to him because I know he's on a job site. I'll say, hey, look at this one, right? Um, for the business to be efficient, you need a tool to quickly estimate and analyze the potential costs and profits from a deal to speed up the process of making offers. Over the course of, central, of several hundred rehabs and consultations, loans, and prospective deals, we've built up a database of costs for typical renovations, right? So historical cost data, along with square footage information from completed deals, allow us to establish average costs per square foot for common renovation tasks and apply averages to prospective deals based on known information. The more you know, the better. Search past listings, aerial views, Google street maps, tax search, tax records, contact listing agents and sellers for photos and property information um, about the property condition. Even without additional information beyond square footage and location, we can find most renovations land within 10K of the average. So with an appropriate contingency or estimates, um, you come up with good numbers to make offers and get quality leads. There's plenty of uh, technology to make your life easier, right? Before I can, if you're, let's pick on Sharon Hill for a second. Sharon Hill, ton of flat roofs because it's row homes, right? If I'm looking at a house with a pitch roof, I can tell you how old the roof is by looking at it. But with a flat roof, you don't know how old it is unless you go up in the rear bedroom and you could see there's a leak on the ceiling, then you know that roof is leaking. But if it's not leaking, you don't know if it's good or bad. And then as a sale, the seller isn't telling you. Well, there's geographical, there's, you can go to satellite view and get the most recent satellite view 
of the roof and you could see, hey, does this roof like it's been looked like it's been replaced in the last five years? That's a time saver. It's a quick way to I figure out if you're gonna have to budget for a roof in the, the thing. You can do a Google view of the house before you go to it, which I do a ton, just to see like, hey, does it look like a dump? Like, yeah, maybe this was from five years ago, but chances are it didn't get much better. No, they're selling it as a deal, right? So it probably didn't get a whole lot better, you know? So use technology to cut time, save time, save money, uh, and use like your agent say, hey, send me the last three houses that look like flips in the neighborhood, right? They'll send it to you. They'll send you the pictures. You can show that to your contractor and say, hey, I was at this house, took these videos. What would it cost me to make this house look like this? Give me a ballpark, right? I'm not trying to get a perfect number right now because I need to make an offer very quickly. I'm just trying to get a ballpark so I can put an offer in. And once I know we're really talking and maybe they're going to accept my offer, then maybe I can get my contractor in there. Or maybe they give me a three-day contingency to have a contractor walk through. Now, if it's on the market with a realtor, that's highly unlikely. They're getting as-is offers. They're not going to give you an inspection contingency because the agent knows what to do. It's off market and you can convince the seller different story, right? Yes. You sit your car and do it, just mm -hmm. release it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mess around with it. I don't have that great control, but uh, I'll try to use that. I'll try to check out, like, flying around and taking mm -hmm. still shots of pictures and see if there's any climbing on the roof and all that stuff. And you can go back and say, hey, what's this? Well, I'll do that. Little girl. I want to see you engage the roof. This doesn't look like it's so awesome. It's just like a crazy technology that 10 years ago, you just couldn't have and you got to go on the ice or you're setting somebody up there, buying in the ladder, something crazy to like that before, you know, but new technology, you know. But yeah, there's also, um, if you're new, you can do uh, a walkthrough inspection with the home inspection company, right? You can have a home inspector. You know, you don't want to pay them for a full report. You're just saying, hey, spend an hour with me and pick this place apart. Because the home inspector is going to tell you the worst of it. Contractors can tell you they can fix everything, right? Because they want the job, right? And they can fix it. It's more about the price. The home inspector can give you, you know, you're taking notes as they're walking through with you. Hey, oh, I see a run that could be knob and tube. Your contractor doesn't tell you until the walls are open, right? Because it's an upsell, right? Now, Good contractors won't do that to you, especially the relationship with you. But most contractors know the word upsell, right? And they know, hey, if they happen to see a frayed wire going up the wall, but they don't mention it, chances are once you're closed and you're already knee deep in it and they open those walls, they can then sell this to their buddy to come do an electrical job and they get a cut of that because they're a general contractor. So I'm not saying this is what they're all doing. I'm just saying, look out for yourself. And if a home inspector really is there to look out for you, the contractors there tell you everything they can do, right? Mm -hmm. Buy that. Yeah, oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah, I have no problem with that. Really. Yeah, yeah. If it's done, I have two weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't it cheaper? Yeah. I had my, I had a like a pitch and a little neck shingle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Involved. All right, so uh, assumptions. It should never go without saying, but never buy property site unseen or based solely on an estimate. The goal is to prioritize leads and make revocable offers. Again, when you're buying off market, you can add things in like inspection contingencies because the seller doesn't have an agent there to tell them what's in their best interest, right? So they don't know that not getting a deposit and not getting a, a inspection or and having a inspection contingency is not in their best interest, right? So when you're buying off market, you can kind of skirt around a lot of these things. And uh, now when I say site, you know, site on scene, the stuff I bought out in Carbon County and Pittsburgh, I don't go see it before I put it on the contract. I get a, an agent to go walk the property for me. 
they do a video, they send it to me so I can take a look. Before I even sent them, I ran the numbers to make sure they ballpark work for me, you know, and then I send them to the video and then I make an offer based on what I think is going to work. After I make the offer, if it's accepted, then I have like, for because mine are mostly rentals, I have my property manager and the inspector go at the same time. And that's when I decide, okay, am I really all in here? Usually I, if I get to that point, I'm buying the property, just might have to knock some off after the inspection. But so, and you know, the last three I bought, I haven't gone to, I don't know what, the pro I haven't seen the property in person, but I know that I've gotten an agent, I've gotten a property manager, I've gotten an inspector, I had the bank's appraiser go out, you know, that's all those, everyone else has been there. Cause there a chance they missed the leaning wall. Yeah, but highly unlikely, right? Especially the inspector. So um, you can buy it by not going to the property ever. Just be really cautious and know your steps. Just a couple hints. Again, you can work with what's there, right? You can see the difference in these two rooms with just a little bit of paint, all right? That's a huge difference. They even do, we do virtual staging, so you don't have to pay a physical stager to come out and stage your property. It's just, it, it changes the entire dynamic of that property. I mean, it went from. Mm, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 To sell the house. Yeah. It's this value property. You want to sell the house? You're a dead you can't figure out where the stuff's going to go. Which is pretty stupid because y'all always understand the picture of that. Turn it off, fish out of everything. Yep. So there is a problem with the house there's a place. Oh, yeah. There's a ton of stagers. But. For, for me, I've never staged any of my flips. Um, I've done light staging, you know, like little plans, stuff like that. But I'll do virtual staging. I just don't see, especially in this market, it's going to sell. <laughs> it's going to sell. Like, what? Why are you spending three to five grand to rent furniture? It's going to sell. You know, you're going to have multiple offers unless you're just crazy with the price. But um, in this market, it's going to sell. So I don't see the point of it. Pre-COVID, when houses in Havertown would sit for three months, you know, would staging potentially help? Sure, there's benefits to it then. But uh, now, you know, it's not a, a worthwhile. Now, if you're if you're selling in like a like one nine one two one zip code of Philly, right? Like it's not a super high end selling neighborhood and you do a really nice flip and you want to do some staging it might make sense right because your average days on market is 70 there if you're the staged beautiful house that might go down to 30 right so sure it might make sense and there's easy ways to do that just pull the comps look for all the flips that have been staged see how quickly they sell versus the ones that haven't this isn't hard research to do like any realtor could do this for you like that you know it's easy Percent on it, but if I have a partition, we're going to be two percent 
instead of taking that money that's taxed as income, I could leave it on the table and go towards my down payment for certain things. I can't use it for the down payment per se, but I can use it for taxes, fees, everything that goes with closing costs. It's not by every 20% down. So that's the source of the season for the real bank account. We can show that money. But when it comes to what you can do with one way and one out, that's where that price point can be back and looking at it. It doesn't show the whole story, but it gives you a good snapshot of what they bought for before. And then you see the after picture when the what's listed or cops were reversed and something that's been sold in the last 90 days, 120 days. It gives you an accurate image for you of where things are selling, where the market is. But you do, you do a little bit of due diligence. And a lot of us will just kind of see, like, oh, I remember that house when it was up for sale. Or we'll get a list of the uh, real life, like, we'll just remember the picture or remember the address. And then we'll see that in the digital market again, six, nine, ten months later. We get to see what they do with it. Realize that I never thought of it. It's already charged me now. They priced it to a point that's higher than where I want to pay for it because now we're at that threshold of it's not making the smart bucks. He's Negative 50 years, but well, that's not sustainable. The buy something that's going to be that he doesn't have to invest the money that it gives you the equity, and then you can refinance. You also have to always have a tenant for your refinance, so you can take the cash out of the property at 75% of um, what other words you need to be based on the rental side of it. So there's different ways you can use the lending sides to give yourself equity, especially multiple families in the company. And that's really good. And to just to help, another tip, agents have the MLS. There are sites like PropStream that regular consumers can sign up for. They're like a version of the MLS. You do have to pay for it, but it's not like super expensive. It might be like called PropStream, P-R-O-P-S-T-R-E-A-M, PropStream. Yeah. yeah, if you have access to the MLS, great. Right. And actually, when I when I got into real estate was to be an investor, like when I, in 2012, when I bought my first house, I'm like, cool, this is fun. Maybe I'll get my real estate license part time and invest in real estate. And then I realized you need money to invest in real estate, you know, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. So I started selling real estate on the side and then became a realtor. And that became my full time thing and then backed into investing. But I think a lot of people start that way. A lot of people on my team, you know, they got their license to be investors and then they realized, oh, crap, I need a ton of money to invest. Let me start selling real estate. So a lot of people I talk to similar, you know. It depends. I have an agent on my team did it in like a month, but he's a mad person, right? I had an agent on my team do it in like a month, but he's a crazy person. Like he was pounding the commission and you know, but you know, I think a couple months, two, three months, you know. So this is just some examples of uh some things you can do without spending a ton of money to upgrade the exterior of a property. So let's talk about levels of renovations, right? Again, I have a scope I use for all of my rentals because most of the rentals I'm buying are in a certain uh, rental class, right? That being, um, I'm usually buying C to D rental classes. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. And this will all be, I have this recording as well and it'll be on our YouTube as well. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, but no, feel free. Um, so yeah, like I, I look for a certain rental class. Now I do have some properties that are in like B neighborhoods, you know, like, and I buy those mostly because the equity's there and they make sense, but they don't cash flow a whole lot because the taxes are usually too high. So I'm usually looking for properties in C and D class neighborhoods for, for rentals. If you're looking Delaware County, that's like Darby, you know, uh, what's that? Chester. <laughs> Chester's a little bit lower than that. Yeah. Chester, and there's sections of Chester. Boston's yeah. actually not, Boston's like a C, you know, that's that's higher. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, you know, like Fallcroft, okay. maybe, yeah, like Fallcroft, Sharon Hill, Darby, um, even sections of Upper Darby, um, uh, Chichester, those, like, talents, that's considered, like, C, D type rent. Chester could be, you know, an F, you know, like there's, there's, there's a lot of parts of Chester's that are, that are tough. Uh, and now there's like the outskirts of Chester or near Widener. Those rent like crazy, 
you know, if you get a house in that like little subsection there wider with all the cameras, you know, you're renting for six fifty, seven hundred dollars a room to students, but it's only like two neighborhoods, right? So uh so um when it comes to rental grade, and I, I made this mistake early on because I read all the the Burr books and I was like, I want these places to be beautiful and amazing and I want them to look the way I want them to look if I live there. And sure, but focus on the important things. Make sure the roof is good. Make sure the heater is good. Make sure your windows are good, right? Make sure your electric's not shot and your plumbing's good. As long as those things are good and you know you're not going to have to put a roof on it in the next three, four years, you know you're not going to put a furnace in it in the next three, four years, everything else can stay and focus on paint, appliances, low-cost tile, Home Depot fixtures. You don't want to be spending more than $18 per square foot, right? That's, you know, as the stuff I buy, our property managers know we don't want our turnover to be more than two to 3000 for turning over the unit, right? And that's in worst case scenario. And usually we want it to be cleaned up and ready to go. If it needs to be painted or I have damaged flooring or maybe there's an appliance. I'm not trying to spend more than 3000 to turn the unit over. Okay. Um, and that's like a one to two bedroom apartment. Sorry. Two to 3000 to turn the unit over. So a tenant leaves and it's in a rough shape. I'm not trying to spend more than three grand to turn it over. Right. Uh, if it's in okay shape, less, you know, and ideally as little as possible. Right. Um, you have to be careful because remember your where you make your money is on the back end when you refinance, right? The the money is always in the refinance, right? So for instance, that house I spoke about in the beginning, the Southwest Philadelphia property, I still have today. And it was one of my smallest deals and it's one of my favorite deals because in 21, I was looking at buying a duplex with my sister under that LLC. And we had just enough in the account to buy it. But like, wait a minute, I have this property that I bought in 2018 that I haven't touched. So I went to the bank and I asked them to appraise it again, appraise for 150. Well, at this point, my mortgage paid down to like 68,000 and it's now worth 150, 75% of that's like 112. So I pay off the first and I take the difference and that's a cash out refinance. So it's not taxable income because it's a loan against my property. So I was able to buy this duplex with found money, essentially, because I'm not being taxed on it. And it's from my property. And I was I had a room, you know, I didn't have to deplete our entire account to do it. So the money is in the refinance. If you could buy a bunch of properties and every 10 years you pull the money out of them, five to 10 years. And that's the game with commercial. Like commercial real estate, they're not trying to pay their mortgages off. Every five, that's there's a reason there's a five year balloon on most commercial mortgages because they expect those people in five years to refi and pull money out, right? It's free money. So, sorry, that was a little off topic, but. How, how did you guys change now that, like, like, you're getting a minor right now? I was going to add sort of the value depreciation. So, it's at 2.25%. Yeah. So, it's yeah yeah right. so don't never touch the first never touch the first like ever right like that and that's the another problem with the real estate market because so many people if you owned a house during covid or you bought a house during covid you're paying 2.753 percent why would you ever sell that house right. it makes zero sense to sell it so most of my clients that would be like selling a twin and moving up to a single family you know going from 250 to 400 well now that's going from 300 to 550 but the payment triples because the interest rate's not three percent it's seven percent and they're just not doing it they're usually they're actually just keeping the house and staying there or they're renting it out and buying another house so it's that's what's really hurt the regular resale market but but you're talking about just on the residential line remember commercial is always higher um but like for instance i the the 10 unit I had in Potsdam, our first on it was four and a half percent. So I'm ready. I'm actually ready to 1031 it pretty soon because I know by 2025, it's going to balloon and I have to refi it. And I, if I refi it 7%, my profits, 
And I'm just like, I don't want that property anymore, which is fine. I have plenty of equity. I can do something better with the money, you know? Uh, what this is, where it's not paying interest, or sorry, it's not paying tax on the equity that you build on that property. Basically, just take all the money you're making to buy so the way the irs sees it and we had one of our last ones was on 1031s and it's recorded on youtube i had a 1031 consultants come in because I'm not a tax guy. I know the basic stuff to help me to pay less, but you know, when it comes to like the ex extreme details, right? So the, the IRS wants you to continue moving up, right? It's monopoly. They want you to keep playing monopoly. So if you buy of equal or greater value for investments, they're going to lend you. If you do it the way they want you to do it, which is within 45 days of selling the, the property identify the new property and then within six months close on the new property of equal or greater value and that could be multiple properties too so you can combine like two properties to equal or greater value as long as you move up with it in their time frame they let you roll that money forward now if you don't use all of it that's fine too it's called a boot there's like a portion of it that you don't use they'll tax you on um uh, if, but you can't do that with your primary, right? And you can't do it in like kind situations. So if your uncle wants to sell his house to you, they know, and they don't, they won't let that happen, right? They won't let him sell an investment property to you of equal or greater value and roll. They're, they're very specific with how you can use the money. Um, in your regular home, so the home you own, as long as you live there for two years or two of the last five years, and the profit you're making as a single person is less than 250000 or as a couple 500000 you don't pay capital gains on that. If it's more, you do, which is crap in my opinion, but that's, you know, the IRS oh, world. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Okay, zero. Yeah. All right. So uh, number two, simple rehab. <clears throat> Place all fixtures in their existing locations, switch plates, etc. Interior paint, entry grade carpentry or carpet uh, or hardwoods, entry grade granite in kitchen, two dollars per square foot tile and bath. Exclude or include approximate four dollars for an extra roof slash AC unit. Forty eight dollars per square foot is what you're looking at in terms of a simple rehab, right? Um, again, these numbers are estimates. They are ballparks. Still talk to your contractors. Still come up with numbers, but they are good to get started with, right? Now, there's always things that, yes, you. This is. The lipstick what's behind the wall all right well you're planning on doing all this and you know you drill a screw into a wall to put a piece of drywall or replace a piece of drywall or to take a, a cap off of a, an outlet and it's soft and then you realize there's termite damage behind it there's things like that that can happen so that's why you want the inspections right to see what's actually behind the walls or have a qualified contractor walk with you but these are if all else is well this is what we're doing Basic remodel. So everything in a simple rehab, plus replace the doors, the windows, the trim. You're adding a level of value by enhancing the existing layout, right? So move slash remove one to two walls, generally in in uh, living spaces. So most of the houses in our area were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Most 40s and 50s. And back then, the heating systems weren't great right they just were enough to heat a room and you were all it was all about efficiency now we have central air and central heating and because of that you don't need as many walls so the 
trend of open concept came in because you can heat a larger space for much easier, much cheaper, much less. When you're buying these older houses that are fixer uppers, chances are those walls haven't been removed yet because no one's done any work to the property. That's why you're getting a deal. So opening that up could be a huge value add because you're modernizing the home, right? You're taking it from a 50s home and making it a today home, right? And or a home that was built in the last 20 years, right? And that could be a huge value add. So yes, if you're doing a basic remodel, opening a wall is something that's worthwhile. Again, factor in if it's a structural wall, if you're gonna need an engineer's report, how much time that's gonna cost you on the back end. Those things are things to factor. Um, another thing that I get quite often from our investors is, hey, this is a four bedroom house with a one bathroom. Should I make it a three and two and have a primary suite versus having four bedrooms? This is really tough. If it's a rental, you want the fourth bedroom because it rents for more as a four bedroom, right? And you're better off just adding a powder room somewhere else in the house. If it's in a, a heavily residential neighborhood, having a primary suite generally works out better for you, right? Because you're appealing to more buyers. Really have to weigh your target audience, right? If it's a neighborhood that the family size is usually bigger in that neighborhood, you want the four bedrooms, right? If it's a typical family size neighborhood, you go with the three and two, right? So it could be good, but generally I always lean on, it's better to have more bedrooms, okay? Unless one's like a closet, you know, they have those like extra rooms that really should just be a bathroom to begin with. Um, yeah. So uh, removing the walls, opening, combining spaces makes sense. Complete minor plumbing and electrical to expand configuration, kitchens and baths. So minor, you're not replumbing the entire house. Right? You're not ripping everything out and replumbing. You're just running new lines for moving the kitchen, moving the bathrooms, adding a half bath, et cetera. Um, include an extra 8,000 for extras like roof, HVAC, and driveway. 8K is like roof and another 8K for HVAC, not together, right? So your general flat roof on like a Sharon Hill house is $4,500 now. It used to be three grand a few years ago. Um, your general basic pitched Cape Cod pitched roof is starting at 8K. I mean, I just did a twin on Fairview and it was like eight for like just a twin, you know? So roofs have gotten a lot more expensive factor for that. Um, HVAC, if you don't already have ductwork, it can get very expensive, right? It, usually you're not calling SELA or WH or whatever. Like you're not calling those companies to do your HVAC and flip. You're just not. You're looking for a local guy that probably speaks Russian or something, and he can do your HVAC for you, you know, and that's the one you want to do your, your, your HVAC system and your flip, right? Because instead of it being $22,000, it's going to be twelve grand for a full new system with ductwork, you know? And it, yes, is the quality going to be the best quality in the world? No, but it's going to be good enough, you know? So with basic remodels, you're usually factoring about $65 per square foot. Major remodels. So this is everything, right? This is um, everything, right? So your basic remodels, roof, HVAC, deck, porch, complete major plumbing, electric, all of it, right? I'm not sure if I said this in the beginning. The price per square foot is not including labor, okay? That's your contractor has to give you that number, right? So this is your finishes, your materials, your systems, it's not labor, right? So this helps you figure everything else out and then have your GC tell you what they'll charge you for labor. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, and like most contractors in Philly are, are working for less than $150 a square foot. That's, you know, that's the good ones, right? You can find the other guys. Yeah. All right, so estimating square footage from the MLS. Start with the MLS information from current past listings. 
use the above grade square footage and total square footage, but never trust these numbers fully. I'm an agent. We put these numbers in. So, you know, odd agents don't know what finished livable square footage is. They don't know what above grade versus basement square footage is. Uh, they don't know if a house is bigger than it looks. Many times I go into a house and I'm like, oh my God, this house is 400 square feet than they, more than they listed it for. And their agent just doesn't know because they didn't measure the property. And they just thought the public records is what is supposed to be correct, right? No, like your job is to make sure the listing's correct. So these could be benefits to you because then you could buy it for 1300 square feet and relist it for 1700 square feet because you have the measurements to prove it, right? Uh, but it also hurts you in estimating your renovations because it's a 1,300 square foot house. You're basing your numbers at 1,300 square feet. When you close, oh, wait, this is a 1,700 square foot house. These costs are a lot higher than I thought. There's a whole two extra rooms I didn't factor for here. All right. And there's a walkout basement that I can add to the square footage. Or they were counting the basement and they shouldn't have been because there's no egress. So these are all things to pay attention to to make sure you're hitting the right square footage. But Usually a good agent could tell you if it's right or wrong. Estimating square footage from the tax, tax records. You can pull the tax records from the MLS listing or perform a tax record search. Again, I don't think you need to go this far. I mean, you're if you're buying something on the market that, you know, you're either seeing it, you can take a look at the size of the property, see what's in the public records. Uh, if you're buying it off the market, I mean, it's generally what's in the public records is correct, but you can do a quick measurement. You don't have to go and back your way into figuring out the square footage based on the tax records. Right, so use the highest number available for the building area description. So total building area is best. Uh, total finished square footage plus any square footage listed in other rooms, base square footage plus any square footage listed in the basement plus any other rooms. You know, ultimately, you're trying to compute the highest logical number of square feet that you intend to touch or renovate. So worst case scenario, all of my numbers are based on worst case scenario, always. What is the worst case scenario here? And that's what my offer is based on. You can try to be uh optimistic and get burned constantly you know because you're underestimating what it's going to cost you uh, a couple final thoughts the square foot number the square foot number in the tax records may not be the most accurate actual measurements however is uh, it is consistent enough to be useful and is the basis for our estimates tax records in the mls come directly from local county and jurisdiction tax records and will be more or less accurate and or complete depending on the county. Use the low fly aerial from the MLS, Google and Street View to confirm the size, additions, conditions. This is really helpful because again, like in our area, in most areas in Pennsylvania, all these houses were built around the same time. So if you're in a neighborhood like Colonial Park in Springfield, they're all two story rectangular colonials. But if you look at that neighborhood from an aerial view, You'll see a bunch of them have had bump outs. They've had, uh, uh, you know, like bumps out to the side, bump out to the back, you know, a two story addition on the back, a garage added. They've, over time, people have customized these homes. And some of them might not have pulled permits or, you know, called their tax collector to let them know they want to pay more taxes. So pay attention to those things when you're, you know, if you know the house, all the houses in this neighborhood are 2,000 square feet and you're buying a house and it looks like it's 3,000 square feet, you might want to factor that for the taxes on the property. So when you close, it's not going to be recorded, right? Okay. So there's a lot. Sorry if I crammed the, the end part in because I normally cut off around eight, but we had a good one today. So kind of open forum, any questions, anything you learned uh, that, you like to talk about today thing you'd like to add any random questions you want to ask that might not have been exactly this topic um i think i would ask if they've got a title right when 
most of the wholesale that I work with, when they come through the deal, they already have so they have a title on their farm with and they've already pulled title on the property to make sure they're not going to can't help it sit, right? And usually the ones that fall apart are the ones that they've got to be a little excited and check and see if they're coming in. So, and, you know, the property is about to close their house. Well, yeah, it's like it happens wholesale. They don't think, oh, why is the seller so excited to get this house off of you? It's because they've got a foreclosure clients and you didn't ask them, but they didn't tell you. You're two days before closing and the seller calls. It's like, oh, they close you. That happens a lot for real people. Um, so, I would just make sure they've got a title search, the biggest thing. To ensure that the price they're asking you is enough to pay out of the ball for you know. Um, I've had so many deals with wholesale offers of thousand dollars. They didn't realize okay. all the stuff that you know the seller had to pay off to get this house sold for a year. So that's one. I, yeah, I don't want to say, um, you know, like the big wholesalers are the ones be more expensive, like say a property. So like. New Western or these bigger companies that have this huge staff with overhead, they trying to make 20, 30 grand on how many these properties. It's not a whole lot of new companies for the deals. Whereas you can find a brand new wholesaler, it's really good at finding deals with many people and they don't have any advertising or overhead. They can make a deal at that price. You know, so I don't think it's really the Level of the company, it's more just the, the person that's selling. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are the, the local guys have to be a sort of new price on the way you market the deals. So, you know, you need to find more. Yeah. Can you, uh, do the better method? Which level of rehab would you say is usually? And I enjoy the burn method because it's really honestly not that difficult to figure out what the value of going by. Right? Like so the neighborhoods average and not all the homes are pretty much close to say we're pretty invested in it, right? Like I I it's just like a wallpark. Telling you, hey, this house should be close to the house for 86 grand. This person found me about 50 or something. You know? yeah. uh, and that's the, when you're doing a burr, the biggest thing is you're planning on holding this property for at least a few years, if not longer. So spend the money on the roof, spend the money on the burrs, right? Those are the two most expensive things that are taking you early on in the burr. So you don't want to do it early on. Because yes, you're putting only five percent for expenses, but that five percent over a year is a whole lot. Over five years, it is right, and it, then your roof goes. Okay, the money's in there. So if you know the roof only has a few years left on it, even if it's not looking, change it up. You don't have to worry, right? If the furnace, yeah, you got to get it to the oven, get it to run, but you have to you have to be servicing that thing every year. Just put a new furnace. Right, but the floor if they look like this, you know, like don't go you know, spending the top amount of money you can. Um, that's the important part when it comes to the bird, knowing that you're not going to get something huge early on after you move in progress. That's when it's um, also, too, if you do pay for a furnace or a roof, go with somebody that gives you a lot of people to this issue in three times. Ten years, you're going to be back to you. Oh, they're so busy. I'm going to have to go back. But if you're going to money into it, I don't want to be like a bad service that we're not doing. We've got these habits. And the good thing about birds is that it scales like really comfortably. So it starts small. Like, that's why I like top of life for any investor. I think it's like terrible advice to myself and the lady to tell them how to do But I just know how starting a thing goes. And it's usually never good. You have a little chair, start small, get a roll, get a, you know, cheap and less. Get, get, get for it on a cheap You know, you're good at getting your big boss, taking all that, um, really good out, right? Um, 
understand the process, but then it gets fun because once you get a work for you, it's not even good. And you can no longer live in the top of the building. So I can buy a building, but close to nothing in it, it's just to more rents and now it's working. Right? So that's why I say I'm not going to go into two or three grand units I mean, turning them over. My focus is so much making it as beautiful as it is taking it from six hundred dollars to fifty. Because now monthly my income up and my patents, and I can go to my bank and say, hey, I want this at eight thousand. Now it's like thirteen thousand. I want to be five ten and pull that money. Right? And that money is just the money that goes in the payment and the living. Okay, a lot of times it's more than you know, it's again the plain tax code to come back. I, we've done a 1031 where I sold like a little home in Camden, $80,000 profit. 1031 was an apartment building, and some other one. And then a year later, we find something on the app. So I, it's like legal watching the money. You know, it's crazy. That's what it is. Um, that's, you can do that do it over and over. And the good thing about the small ones is when you start with them and you scale up, eventually you're going to with small ones. So I think you want to pop it for your life and make them as big a deal as anything. Good question. Sure. For that, I'm talking about this. Can you wait to buy your property? I always factor in the beginning, regardless, that I'm going to take the property. Because my goal is to not be mad, right? So always put that in your mind, even if you don't buy on Facebook. You might be one of those people that loves Mammy people. That's fine. It's cool. Keep doing it forever. But you get to a point where you have enough properties, you don't need to pay. You better learn how to property. So if you don't factor for that now, it hurts you with that, right? So even if you don't plan on paying a property manager, it's still a factor in your mind. Now, Everything within like a half hour in the end. Uh, it's probably not the smart, but I mean, I'm a realtor. I can pay on a team and show the property. It's not that difficult for me or anything like that. I'm going to wrap it around here. Stuff that's more than a half hour, like they toss out stuff, put a car on the counter, you know, which is, uh, I love it. Actually. I love that I can't run a great place. It's like, you know, you know how hard it is to explain to my wife at 8 p.m. that I don't have to see a few hundred bucks, like, yeah. versus a couple of years in the back. So, no, I love not having that dog, you know. Yeah. So, like, that's, it's honestly, it's like, a, if you have a good property manager, then you also need to, right? Like, your property manager knows the market, understands what you're trying to do, uh, gets, gets it, you can do it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. From the perspective of an agent investor, um, I one of the things that we might see is that you know you can get your buyer permission, you can buy it, you can go like that. But if you're employing someone else to do that, plus all you know, what I was talking about, I think they would go, I don't necessarily have the energy or time to do that. How does that affect me? Do they just become your buyer agent or do you know some other? Well, yeah, you can sign a higher agency. You should sign an agency agreement, or you can uh, kind of just say you're lazy for yourself, or you're going to hire one of us to run around for you. Yeah. And then you find a property that's for the things. So that yeah. is, we're not, the other thing can change too. You can look at the MLS and see what the commission structure is. So there is a lot of people that have to look at people around. That will now list for the firing of the city cop. Is it legal? Kind of. You can list whatever you want. There, we're on this precipice of a judgment in this idea that the buyer agent should get paid by the buyer, not through the property mm -hmm. seller of the seller agent. A word around that I've come up with recently is let's say he has an on market property. I have buyers. When I'm going to, I'm going to refer my buyers to him. We're going to renegotiate the deal. He's going to give me a referral to my buyer, but he's taking what's called a new agency. 
and he's going to work both sides of the deal. And I'm going to get a thousand dollars for the giving in life. But the only I only get it works, and I'm doing the due diligence of helping my clients out by making sure their fiduciary share responsibility is met when they have originated the document of the sales contract. But you know, I don't know, once you enter the sales contract section, the negotiations are going to have to happen. And that's when the seller agent is most important because he has to keep both people at the table. And it's kind of easier to do that once you're just one entity where he has to wait for me to talk to my client. So they go back to him. If you're both sides of the deal, you already know your sellers need to be. And now you're just trying to leave the middle of some of them. And tell them why it's also a new deal because this is what the sales contract said. Sure, we found a week in the room, we're going to give you a credit. Uh, it's the rule that you spend 20 grand for me and now Now go ahead and hire your own group of them once you close the property. The best section, but you know that's a material defect that could have like you yes, and now it's like buying a used car that has one hybrid. You're so, you know, a law, right? And you told the hybrid. So you can only buy the house, sit on the 10 grand, you would need the 10 grand as since you have less money coming out of your pocket, you kind of hold that 10 grand for. When it does, you need to call. I think I'd like the, you know, the, not the mindset of the huge part of the thing, but that's how you see what happens in the You know, so like you see the plan for the agents that are working in deals, and I think the agents here too, okay, instead of agents like you, you find me a deal, you can call you know, I say the agents are closing here, you're like, yeah, so you know, I might not. Find the deal, you can be directly like, on this transaction because you're helping me make money. So, happy you're making money. The, there are many, like, you can negotiate, hey, uh, you're going to let me use my buyer. Just know I'm the best rate. You know, more so, you can like, work out a referral. Um, on every deal, right? So, you can say, hey, you know I'm going to be working with you as well. And you can use my deals. Uh, the firm is one of them. So, you know, and the agent's smart and it's good for them, they're going to do it. Now, they realize that it's not that it has lesser sauce and it's good luck wasting their time. Doesn't make sense, but that's a business thing, right? Uh, but yeah, you can work out with it. You know, it makes sense. But if they're, you know, um, up till recently, I got my own lawn, but I'm going to spend my only day off running my own, you know, and uh, I was paying it. Until you got too expensive, then you're a lot of you know, but until it's worth it to you, you can make some money. What's up? Okay. Anything else? No? No? Uh, good. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is just one time thing. Yeah. You know, I try to think about it's about 10 topics a year, focus on the per all times. We'll maybe 10 30 long chain and then we'll tax. Oh, yeah. yeah, and that yeah. one I got a recording up on our, our YouTube so check that out. Uh, and the tax 31, 10 31 exchange specialist that we'll go in once that one is cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's that? We serve the new food. Uh you can look up Great Delco um and uh or you know it's really over with one of the looking for the things that uh we see all we need time to Was that the same time every month? Yeah, we try to be the third Wednesday of every month at six o'clock. Every now and then, um, we have a conference or whatever. So yeah. other, for the most part, oh, right. and it's so only six. Yeah, okay. we're usually that other room. All right, sorry. That's what we have. Yes, yeah. Small order. Thank you. Weekly departments. What's that? Weekly departments. Uh. Be very, very careful. Make sure you know who your partner is. And, and that's good at like that in the mix. So right. I was going to, I was going to be, I had somebody in, yeah. right my family. Yeah. And they were like, oh, I was interested in flipping houses because I had the money to do it. So I was going to be like the side of the person. Sure. I'm not going to be the children. Two different works in the house. Yeah. So then it was like more intriguing to them. Yeah. And I was like, 
So I at the very next minute, and then I started working with you know, and I think so I'm like, oh, I never had to like it's like anything. Yeah. So then you know, I'm really mad. Yeah. Yeah. Really mad. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're talking about it. So yeah. That's the reality. So when you're doing partnerships, and I have plenty of partnerships that everything yeah. uh, one and I'll do four guys, one with two, one with right. three, one with three. like they're my friends. Mm -hmm. so that makes it easy. I have no yeah. trouble. Yeah. But yeah, that's it's not always the best, right? Like you know, you want all of you business with yeah. friends. Yeah. And I don't I have really good friends, I don't think it's mm -hmm. I it has to be the right person, yeah. right personality, yeah. because everything is in the right. Absolutely. We are very specific part of operating group it says we love it. Right. And it's like there's not gonna be any uh you know the next thing which uh from the world. It's a new degree, you know, yeah. like great degree, but it's you know, it's not yeah. you gotta have all of it. Everyone has to have a stability, you yeah. know, figure that all out before you. You can't come to terms with just that. Right. Exactly. So, Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And it happened. It did happen. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, it, because that's when I realized the money. Yeah. And then it got hit. Yeah. And I was like, that's how it is. Somebody telling me I will be the final supplies. Yeah. Like you're, you're, we need your money for the supply. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, for you, I know. And then it became a problem with my guess because they wanted me to buy everything off the line because they gave me an estimate. Yep. Oh, well, if you need to go buy it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. If they can't run, like if they can't run a simple bathroom yeah. remodel, you know, how are you going to, uh, 